Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I want to talk about the benefits of obedience. I, I have, um, over the years, talked a lot about the consequences of disobedience, and we probably all know that. We've, we've all been in places where we've disobeyed and we've paid the consequences for it. I've told you about running from the Lord in my teenage, teenage years and, and, and then finally coming to the Lord and then running from the Lord again because I did not want to pastor and ran from him for years of not wanting to, to be a pastor. And so um, I know the consequences of, of not obeying the Lord. But I want to talk this morning about the benefits of obedience. I, I was surprised, and I was just mentioning to Justin Crowell, that, uh, I was surprised in this election time that I, I see things on, on Facebook and from people that profess to be Christians and putting things there that do not line up with the Scripture. And, and I'm always surprised by that. And so we as Christians need to learn to obey the Lord. There are many benefits for those that are willing to do so. The Lord gives incentives to those who are willing to obey him. If I obey him, it says in tithing, for example, he says there he will rebuke the devourer. In other words, the very things that eat away the, corrupt, the, um, the, the decaying of what this world is all about, he says, I rebuke that. I'll make your stuff last longer so that you don't have to buy as often. If you obey in tithing, I rebuke that, and I will open the windows of heaven, the promises of us obeying him and giving to the Lord absolutely first. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, he says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, it is telling us that children are to obey their parents and honor them, and for this reason, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I used to remind my kids all the time about that. Do you want to live long? <laughs> learn, learn to obey and honor your parents. Amen. So look at Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, Rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field come along now and sit down to eat won't he rather say prepare my supper get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink after that you may eat and drink will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do so you also when you have done everything you were told to do should say we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So Jesus begins, first of all, with teaching that if someone sins seven times in one day and comes back and repents each time, then he says we are to forgive them. And in another place, he tells the disciples 70 times seven. And so we would normally think that anyone who sins against us that many times is not trying very hard. You know, it's like, if they keep doing, this is in one day, if they keep coming back and doing that again and again, we go like, you're not very sincere about this. I mean, you're not really repenting, or you wouldn't do this again. We, we always make that statement, fool me, uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. We're patient enough for maybe two, maybe three times, but after that, you're going to get slammed if you do that one more time. 
And that's the way that we normally think. And so the apostles probably would have thought the same thing. I mean, I'm going to give them grace for three times. I'm going to go way out on a limb. I'll give them grace for three times. But seven times, Lord, man, oh, man, what in the world are you talking about? Increase our faith. Because obviously we're not there yet. We're not there. We're not able to forgive somebody seven times for doing a sin against me. I mean, I think we would all say that. We go, Lord, you know what? I mean, that's a really nice ideal that you have. But, boy, this, you don't know how earth works, do you? That's just not going to happen down here on this earth. And so they're, they're wondering, like we would wonder, how in the world are we ever going to be able to do that? They realize that they need an increase in their faith. So Jesus replies to them a statement, and I, I don't want to you know, mix up all of your theology in one service if this is what you've been taught all your life. But here in this particular passage, what Jesus says there, he says to them, if you have faith, and the words small as are not in the original text. So what he's basically saying here, he says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the two words as small as, or the three words as small as, are added by the translators. They're not in the original text. They're not in the Greek text. And so think about this for a minute. He's not saying if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. Now, now think about this for a minute. Just to to kind of give you some thoughts of this, how many of you have, by faith, moved a mountain lately? Or, as he says here, how many of you have moved a tree lately? Not by chainsaw, but by faith, you said, I want that tree out of my front yard, and I want it over in my neighbor's yard. I put, put it over there. <laughs> how, many, how many of you have done that? Okay, so where are you in your faith? You, I mean, if that's small... If you can move a mountain and move a tree, really small faith. I mean, if you've ever seen a mustard seed, you could barely see that if I had it on the tip of my finger. It, it is such an incredibly small seed. So I would say to you then, okay, don't you guys even have small faith? Because you've never moved a mountain. You've never put a tree somewhere else. You must have incredibly no faith if you can't do the mountain moving, if you can't do the tree moving. But Jesus never, ever condoned small faith all through the Scripture. You see the disciples doing examples of small faith, and he would, he would, in a very nice way, rebuke them. Remember when Peter gets out of the boat, he's walking on water, he sees the winds and the wave, and all of a sudden he starts going underneath the water. Jesus comes over to him and he says to Peter, Oh, you of little faith. Jesus wasn't happy about the little faith. He was saying, that's not a good thing to have little faith. I want bigger faith. I want you to grow in your faith. I'm not, I'm not saying the little faith is a great thing. And so he's not saying it's a great thing here either. He's not saying if you have faith as small as a mustard seed that you can do amazing things. He's wanting something out of each one of us. And so the, the, the mustard seed grows into a tree. It's small, very, very small. Hardly can see it. But it'll grow into a tree because it has the life principle in it. So stay with me here. Jesus is not talking about presumptuous faith. Like I get an idea and, I, and I, I'm looking up there and I'm, I'm looking up towards the mountains and I'm going, you know, God, you weren't really good about where you put that. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really design it for you. I'm going to move that mountain where it really needs to be, where it'll look the best, because that's not, you know, it's not something you're really good at. So I move the mountain, but the people that live up on the mountain, they aren't happy with me. <laughs> and so the people that are up on the mountain, they're like, no, you should have left that where it's at. Put it back. So they have little faith, so they move it back to where it's supposed to be. Can you imagine what this world would be like if small faith does that kind of a thing. If we can just decide, I want this to happen, it's going to happen. So what he's talking about here is not presumptuous faith. He's talking about living faith, faith that comes 
by having a relationship with Jesus. Now, we said, no, that's hard. That's the hard kind of a thing. No, that's what he wants us to have. He wants us to have the kind of faith that hears his voice because I know him. I've spent time with him. It's not the kind of faith that just thinks something up and, you know, and I go, wow, okay, I got this great idea. We're going to move mountains today. Man, oh, man, that'd be great. It's not that kind of faith. It's the kind of faith that hears God saying, you know what? I want you to move that mountain. And we speak what God, what we heard God saying, we speak that word and the mountain moves. I, I can pray all that I want for someone that's sitting in a wheelchair here this morning. I can pray over and over. And, and if I hear a word from the Lord that says, you know what, I want you to tell that person to get up and walk. I heard that. I've heard that. That is the faith that comes from a relationship with the Lord. I've heard him say that. So I say to the guy in the wheelchair, get up out of your chair. You're healed. Walk down that aisle. And he walks down the aisle. Why? Not because I'm some great person or man of, of faith, because I've heard by relationship, I've heard what God said. And now I have the authority to say what needs to be pronounced on the person that needs the healing. So think about that in, the, in relationship to what he goes on to say here. He tells a story about servants plowing and looking after sheep. And he tells about servants after working in the fields. They're coming in and they're cooking meals for their master. So why would Jesus go from talking about faith as a mustard seed to a story about servants working for their master? Now remember... Jesus is still answering the apostle's statement of, Lord, increase our faith. We, we need greater faith because we simply cannot forgive that person seven times. So why would Jesus go into this story? So remembering as he's talking about the apostles increasing their faith, he tells of the life principle that's in this tiny little seed, in this mustard seed, and he tells the parable about the servants. He is telling the apostles here how to increase their faith. Notice in verse 10, Jesus says, when you have done everything you were told to do. You want to increase your faith? <laughs> do everything that he tells you to do. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, although he was a son, he, speaking about Jesus, learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So many times we don't want to obey the Lord because it isn't always easy or it isn't always convenient to obey. If the Lord is prompting you to tell someone about Jesus and you're standing in a crowd of the people that you work with and you're thinking, you know what, if I say something now, this might put me in a place where I don't, have, I don't have the opportunities that other employees will have for moving up. So what do I do? I make a decision right here, and I go, no, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forego this one, Lord. I'm not going to tell them about what you're prompting me to tell them about. And so I'm going to delay that. I'm not going to talk to them about Jesus because I want the opportunity of moving up in, in the future, and this will only harm my chance, chances of that. So obedience, though, to the Lord is not dependent on my convenience or it is not dependent on whenever it is easy. When hardships or difficulties come, are we deciding, okay, that's my choice either to obey or not to obey, but the difficulties are making me want to side with I'm not going to obey. I'm not going to go and do what I'm supposed to do in this moment. So sometimes in our thinking, we think that serving the Lord in, in our lives should be in a way that is always fitting to us and is always comfortable, <laughs> convenient. It is always the way that is the, least, the path of least resistance. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body... Arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, 
He does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. When I was, when I was looking at this verse again, this one part of it just really jumped out to me. It says, arm yourselves with the same attitude. So he's talking about enduring difficulty and hard times, and he says to arm yourself with that kind of an attitude. The kind of an attitude that goes in, in living the Christian life that thinks that you're never going to have any difficulty is the kind of attitude that is like a soldier going out to war and he has absolutely no weapons. If we get some kind of mentality that God is here to make our life entirely comfortable, we're in the wrong, we're in the wrong thought altogether. He has not promised to make our life entirely comfortable. He has promised us that there's going to be persecution for those that follow him. Standing up for Jesus is not always the easy thing to do. I, I mean, I, I saw this, and, and, and I was talking to you about this a couple of weeks ago with the whole thought of what this election holds. And so many people were saying, you know what, I don't, I don't want to ever say that I'm standing for what's right because, man, oh, man, everybody blasts them read an article just a couple days ago about there were, they were planning on doing a repeat of the Brady Bunch. And, of course, they're all older now, so they were going to be showing them as older kids, and they have kids now. Cindy, if you remember, the youngest one that played the youngest daughter in the Brady Bunch, she made some statements that said, I, I believe in a traditional marriage between a man and a woman. CBS called her in and said, what, what are you talking about here? <laughs> and she stated more, fur, more further of what she felt with that kind of an attitude. They canceled doing that show. CBS said, no, absolutely, and definitely you, whoever plays the, the girl Cindy, you definitely are not going to be part of that show. All because she stated something that she felt that she felt marriage should be between a husband and a wife. Wow, where have we gone in America that we punish somebody simply because they say, I believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman. But that's, as Christians, man, oh man, that's going to get bigger and bigger in our job force as you, as, as you stand to, for what the truths of God's word are, people are going to say, well, maybe you shouldn't work here. Arm yourselves with the same attitude that Jesus had as he suffered in his body because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Going into spiritual warfare thinking that you aren't going to face trouble <laughs> is going to leave you defeated over and over again. And so if you have the kind of thinking that you have enough faith for all of your problems to go away, you're going to end up shipwrecked. You're going to end up defeated. If you think somehow, you know, i got to muster up this faith that's as small as a mustard seed, and somehow I'm going to make every single problem that I have go away, you're going to be defeated over and over and over again. Satan is going to have his way with you. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 says, it is, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Ooh, wow. Don't we hate that part? Don't you like the part like where we're going to rule and reign with him? But what, what is he talking about? Paul, like you're really getting off the road here. Suffering for him? What are you talking about? I've got faith, man, that will remove all of the suffering that will come against me. He knows what he's talking about. It was inspired of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And so whenever we give ourselves to obey him, we have to trust that he will give us the strength to overcome any difficulty, any trial, any persecution, 
anything that comes against you by you obeying what God said to do. We cannot back out of obeying him simply because the going gets rough. Sometimes obeying the Lord means that day after day I faithfully work in the fields. I might have to sow in tears, but I know that there will come a time of rejoicing. And so our faith increases only as we learn to obey him in whatever he has told us to do. There's, a, there's the word of God that is full of what he's told us to do. There's the personal word that he gives to you of what he's telling us to do. When I am willing to say, Lord, I'm going to obey you in all of that, my faith increases. <laughs> Jesus' answer in verse 10 gives us two aspects of increasing our faith. First, he says we have to obey, and not just the beginning. Sometimes in our human nature, it's so easy to get something started. And we come up with, with this commitment to the Lord, and we say, Lord, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to start this. A few, a few weeks ago, I was talking about that we needed to make a commitment to praying we need to make a commitment to getting into the Word of God. And, and we make those commitments, but how many of us oftentimes, we get three weeks down the road and we go, boy, I just don't really have time for that. I mean, I'm busy in the morning and I'm busy at the night. And I, don't, I don't really have time to pack that in. We made a commitment to it, but it's so much harder to follow through with that. So he says, first of all, we have to obey what we've committed to him, what he's told us to do. We have to do that all the way all the way till we complete it. He says, when you have done everything that you were told to do, not just start something, not with just the good commitment of being ready to go ahead with something, but willing to follow it through all the way to the end. When the going gets tough, you're still in there. You're still obeying what he says to do. There are times in your walk with the Lord, obviously, that you don't feel like reading the word of God. There are times that you don't feel like coming to church. There are times when you don't feel like praying. That's when obedience kicks in and says, you know what? I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to keep obeying what he told me to do. Faith increases when I keep sticking in there, when I keep consistently obeying what he said to do. Secondly, we have to maintain a humility before the Lord. He says we should say we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Wow. Can you imagine? I, I think, and, and I've told you this so many times, but our relationship with the Lord, he has blessed us with so many good things. He's brought us from death to life, and he's promised us a home in heaven. Just amazing things that he does for us every single day. But oftentimes what we do is we get ungrateful when we, when we come to the place where we feel that maybe God is doing something more for somebody else than he is for me. Maybe he's left me not with an unanswered prayer, and, and I've been praying for this for 20 years, and he hasn't answered it. And yet somebody else has been praying for a week, and they got it. Whatever that is, oftentimes we look at other people and compare ourselves with others, and we go, I don't, I don't want to be grateful. But that's absolutely necessary for making, maintaining our relationship with the Lord. I try to look at it, and when I wake up every single morning, you know what? He has promised us the heaven. He has given us eternal life. He has brought us from death to life. Everything else is just the icing on the cake. I mean, man, he has done so much for us that we weren't deserving of in the first place. Thank you, Lord. Get up in the morning. Thank you, Jesus. You have blessed us with so much. We're not, we're not worthy of any titles or any pat on the back. We have only done our duty. You didn't have to do what you did, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Obedience is not obedience until we have completed all that we've been told to do. And then, after that, maintaining a spirit of humility to keep us in the blessing of God. 
And so the greater our submission to God, the greater our faith. Worship team, get ready to come. And in closing, I want to look at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, look down at verse 5. It says in verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Now, a centurion is the person that in the military, in Roman's military, they, he had men under him, a lot of men under him. He knew what it meant to have authority. But he also knew what it meant to be under authority. And he knew that only those who were under authority could be entrusted with authority of their own. The man knew the source of Jesus' authority. As we are willing to submit to the Lord and as we're willing to obey him, the Lord gives us authority. It doesn't come with disobedience. There's, no, there's nothing that is handed over because we disobey. But when we're willing to obey, our faith increases and he's willing to give us authority. Isn't that incredible? That submission is what gives a person great authority. We, we think of the opposite. We think someone that promotes themselves and pushes themselves forward and that always takes the head of everything. We think of that person with authority. No, that's not, that's not the person with authority. The person with authority is the one that's willing to submit. They know they're under authority. And so Jesus links great faith with submission to authority. You want to be a powerful man and woman for God? Learn to obey. Learn to submit to the authority. Learn to submit to what God wants you to do. And when you've done everything that he's told you to do, believe in humility. Lord, thank you for what you've done. It's not me. It's you. You deserve all the glory. You're the one that gets things done. I'm simply your servant, Lord. Servant that's willing to obey you in everything. Whatever that is, whatever that is, wherever I have to stand for you to obey you, Lord, help me to do that this morning.